Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Glad to see you all with us today in faith and with the eyes of faith. So many of you, uh, just as we are, are so excited about the Word of God and so excited about our faith family. And we welcome you. If you're visiting with us and, and this is your first time checking us out, we're so glad you stopped by and, and, and we, we pray that you'll get something out of this message. I believe I've heard from heaven. So we're going to go ahead and get right into the word of God. But as we always do, I want you to hold up your Bible or whatever you use for your Bible. And I want us to make a confession today. So yes. say it out loud. This is my Bible. This is, is my Bible. Bible. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible. And I love my Bible. So I make this as a confession. So I make this as a confession. That I will meditate therein. That I will meditate both therein. Both day and night. Both day and night. On a chapter in the morning. On a chapter in the morning. And a chapter in the evening. And a chapter in the evening. And because I do. And because I do. My life. Life is blessed. Life is it's blessed. no more a mess. No more Come mess. on, it's no more a mess. No more now, mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch, shall turn to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this, yes. another opportunity to meditate your word, to study your word. Yes, God. We ask that you'll give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that are open and receptive. Wow. Yes, God. Father, this is a very sacred and precious word that comes from you. Yes. We're asking you that you will cause our hearts to be flooded with wisdom and revelation that goes beyond our years and beyond our experience. Yes, God. We pray that not one person that will view this message will, will leave from it untouched and, and unchanged, but that we all will be changed yes. for good in Jesus' in name. Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, this is a, a first, at least as far as I can remember where my wife and I get to share with you from the word of God, and I believe you'll be blessed by it. So open with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Luke chapter 22 once again. Mm -hmm. This is our third session, uh, third message from God on the subject of covenant keeper. Yes. And we're going to continue this series today right here from Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. It says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is Jesus here speaking at the Last Supper during the Passover, right before he went to the cross and died for your sins and my sins. And he makes a bold statement, a very profound statement. He says, this cup that we're drinking, I know it's filled with wine. This bread that we've eaten, I know that it's, it's just natural bread. But as I have said to you before, as we looked at in John chapter 6, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you, you have no part in me. In this very special moment and with these sim, symbolic elements, he says that this cup represents the new covenant that God is making with his people in in my blood, uh, which is shed for you. So we're, we're continuing a series today that we started. If you missed any part of this, of course, we encourage you to go back online and check it out. All of our messages are for free. Mm -hmm. But we're also doing something different today. We're, we're kicking off a campaign called Covenant Keeper, mm -hmm. where we are challenging men and women, husbands and wives, young adults and children, children. Mm -hmm. to make a vow to abstain from sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And through this campaign, we believe that God is endeavoring to save lives from destruction, to save marriages from divorce, yes. to save teenagers from unwanted pregnancy, yes. to save some from contracting life-altering diseases, yes. to save others from ruining their future marriages. Mm -hmm. And through this Covenant Keeper campaign, we are challenging each and every parent to raise their children to keep themselves unto marriage. Mm -hmm. We're challenging every unmarried person, every unmarried man, every unmarried woman to keep themselves until marriage. And we're challenging every husband out there and every wife out there through this campaign 
to make a vow before God to keep yourself in marriage. So we're, we're going to just kick it off today. And this message is actually the foundation of the Covenant Keeper campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll hear more about it. We're going to have vow ceremonies. Maybe teenagers can, you know, get revelation for themselves and decide, you know what, as a little boy, a little girl, teenage boy, teenage girl, I'm going to make a vow to keep myself until I get married and I'm not going to have sex outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. You may be an, uh, an unmarried adult mm -hmm. and you may hear this message. And over the period of time, while we're introducing this campaign and, and rolling it out, you may decide as an unmarried woman that, you know, I know I've, I've done things in the past, but I'm going to make a vow to abstain from sexual immorality. And of course, we're challenging every married person to you know, renew your vows yes. with greater understanding. Things that we're going to see today from the word of God that I believe will put you in a good position. So in this message today, we are simply going to lay the foundation from which this campaign is going to be built. The title of the message is called The Marriage Covenant. I like the way that sounds. I pray that you do too. We're going to see from the word of God what God intended in this most sacred and solemn covenant. And we want to encourage you to be open to see things that you may have never seen in the Word of God before. What I love about the Word of God is that a scripture that I read today has an application for the season that I'm in, you know, at that time of my life. But then you can read it two, three years from now and have a greater revelation that's applicable to your life at the time that you need it. And so we're simply asking that you keep an open heart, open eyes, and be prepared to learn things that you may have never learned before. This series is gonna bless you. Man, this is awesome. So let's, let's go ahead and dig right into it. We're gonna start right here in Luke 22 and verse 20. In the New Living's translation, uh, this time a different perspective. He says here, after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. Mm -hmm. Notice that it's not just a new covenant between me and Jesus or, or between God and Jesus. Mm -hmm. This is a, is my, this cup is the new covenant that God is making between himself and other people. Amen. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood, Jesus said, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So Jesus is referring to a new covenant that God was making with people in his blood. Mm -hmm. New means that there was an old. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've learned already that the Bible is a book of covenants. Yes. I mean, particularly, you know, it says Old Testament, New Testament, but really it should say old covenant and new covenant. The word testament actually in the Greek is covenant. And that's why it reads here. This is the cup of a new t new covenant in my blood. And so I challenge you from this day forward, be covenant minded. Yes. And as you see, we get into the elements of this ministry. I I've been more covenant minded ever since. I, I challenge you when you read your Bible, read it as I'm reading out of the old covenant. Now I'm reading out of the new covenant and you'll find yourself in it all the more. And so, so far in this series, we've learned that there is a danger in being a stranger to the covenants of promise. Stranger danger. Yes. And so we seen the covenant that Noah had with God. And then we took a look at the covenant that Abraham had with God. And then we looked at David, um, who's my all time favorite Bible uh, character. We looked at the covenant that he had with God. And then just last Sunday, we looked at the covenant that Jesus had with God. And so today we're going to take a look at the marriage covenant mm -hmm. as well. You know, uh, in, in talking about the marriage covenant, there's a danger as married people in being a stranger to what we have with the person that we're married to. Mm -hmm. uh, for an unmarried woman or man, there, there's a danger in not knowing what marriage is all about. Yes. And what we're going to learn today is about the marriage covenant. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is. It's not just an agreement. 
it's not just a contract. I know I don't make any light. You know, we go to the state of Texas and we get our licenses for marriage and we make no light of that. But truly, in the eyes of God, when you say I do at that altar, mm -hmm. whether it be before a judge or before a minister, God Almighty sees it mm -hmm. as a covenant in blood. Yes. And that's what we're going to look at today. And then last week we learned about the blood covenant that covenants of old were made in blood and with the shedding of blood. And so we, we see that when Abraham made the covenant with God, it was a blood covenant. We see that there were animals killed and uh, <laughs> it was just almost like a massacre, so to speak. But it pretty much showed that once you make that kind of covenant, there's no turning back mm -hmm. once you go forward. And the only way to break that kind of covenant is by death. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we see so much shedding of blood in the Old Testament where animals were killed to create and formulate that covenant between themselves and with God. Yeah, so covenants of old were made in blood and with the shedding of blood. I, I was just like thrilled last week we, we saw Abraham uh, there, you know, he cut those animals up, bloods everywhere. And then he wakes up to this smoking oven and this flaming toy. I'm like, oh yeah, we about to have some brisket. <laughs> you know, did, did I miss something? We about to eat. You know, I, I'd like to go there in scripture. And so this smoking oven and this flaming torch just represented God himself yes. walking in blood, exchanging vows with Abraham in the blood of these animals yeah. and even much more so God made a blood covenant with Jesus yeah. literally as it were standing in front of you walking in the blood of Jesus saying I'm going to keep you I'm going to never leave you I'm going to never forsake you that uh -huh. you can boldly say the Lord Hallelujah. is my helper and I covenanted in the blood of my son yes God Woo, man what a blessing that is. So God himself made a covenant in the blood of Jesus and anyone, you might be out there today and you just happen to be stopping by and you're listening to this and something is just keeping you stick, stuck here. You, if, if you believe in Jesus as the yes. son of God, that he died for your sins, you get to partake in a covenant with God, partake of his body yes. and his blood. You come into covenant with the almighty God. Yes. So now let's talk about the marriage covenant. Yes. Yes. So in Genesis 2, 23 to 25, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And therefore a man shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed so I, I, I you know every time we read the bible i always like to imagine being in the moment mm -hmm. and so as we go through these verses you know adam is awakened to something he had never seen before I mean, he, he's seen the animal. He's, he's seen the face of God. Yeah. I mean, the first thing Adam ever saw was God blowing into, like, wow, you know, God is breathing into his nostrils, you know. Yes. He sees all the beauties and splendors of earth and his perfection. But one day he goes to sleep. God causes him to go into a deep sleep and he wakes up. And the finest creation on the planet. Somebody described it as a brick house. Oh. <laughs> you know, she's the brick house. You know, you, it, it's just, you know, the, the, you know, the Bible says that God formed man mm -hmm. out of the dust. That's kind of like a lump of clay. But the word that, that's used when he made a woman, uh, the word in the Hebrew says he built mm. a woman with that the is. rib that he was taken. And so there's some truth to she's built. But in, anyway, anyway, so when, when God brought Adam, his wife, he said, now listen to this. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. 
Yes. And, and, and so we're flesh and bone. You know, we say we're flesh and blood. You know, uh, people that are born into our own family. Well, that I've got their DNA. Mm-hmm. And, and in truth, and I'm going somewhere with this, very powerful. Mm-hmm. In truth, we are bone and flesh together. Mm-hmm. At this moment, she has his DNA. Mm-hmm. You could say she has his blood. They are blood related. Mm-hmm. And in the marriage covenant, we're going to see that it's an absolute blood covenant. And I believe you'll appreciate it. Verse 24, of course, it says uh, here, therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife mm-hmm. and they shall become one flesh. Now, now, notice this is the institution of marriage. Yes. You know, they say, which came first, the chicken or the egg or the egg or the chicken? Well, we know the chicken came first, right? You know, yeah. And the same way, man and, and wife came first. Mm-hmm. But he, he establishes for all time that the, the institution of marriage is a man and a mm-hmm. woman before the Almighty God. And, you know, uh, I love gay people. Okay. Uh, I hate all sin. You know, I hate homosexual sin. I hate heterosexual sin. I hate all sin. I mean, to be a lover of God is to hate what God hates. Mm-hmm. But God loves people. Mm-hmm. But I don't care what the states say. I don't care what the government, if the government ever said that, well, we now recognize the marriage between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. That's not a marriage, folks. Correct. And so when we're talking, I just want to be abundantly clear that when we're talking about the marriage covenant, I'm not talking about that guy on TV talking about my husband. No. <laughs> No, sir. No, sir. Or, you know, you, you hear this stuff out there. You know, yeah. a, a woman talking about, you know, such and such. And well, my wife. No, 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 no. That's not real. That That's not a marriage covenant as God God ordained it. He says, so shall a man leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, a man and a woman. Um, and, and then notice here, he says, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, yes. becoming one flesh specifically is referring to the act of marriage, or as some people call it, sex. So we're going to talk about sex. So let's talk about sex, baby. <laughs> let's talk about you and me. Okay. <laughs> um, but before we get into that, um, becoming one goes beyond just the sexual intimacy because you have people outside of that covenant of marriage and, and they, they have sex. But really, what God intended in a marriage is for a man and his wife to be one. Mm-hmm. To be one in name, aim, purpose, focus, and direction. Yes. And I don't have a big part in this message, but I, I truly believe that when we get married, we should become one mm-hmm. in name. And let me tell you, unmarried ladies, um, when you do get to that place, go ahead and take his name. It's one of the most respectful and honorable things that you could do. It is. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, you know, if she wanted to hyphenate, you know, a Yarbrough, you know, Marquita Yarbrough Scott. Woo, man. <laughs> I wish it would. I wish it would. Y'all, y'all got to help me. Stop it. Stop no, what it. I'm saying Stop is, it. it's just, a, and when you see covenants of old in the scripture, I mean, God changed Abram's name from Abra, Abram to Abra Ha. I'm and I'm, I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but he injected his name, God's name, into Abram's name, changed his name altogether. I mean, it's a huge honor for me. Mm-hmm. It's that, an honor for a lady to take on the name of her husband um, because you've been asked to, in essence, do life with this person. So I'm asking you to be my partner in life. And a part of that requires a name change. And just like you said, uh, when Abram went into covenant with God, there was a name change. We see Sarai became Sarah, Mm -hmm. you know, so there was a name change that took place. And and, and even beyond that, that man should be leaving his father and mother. Mm -hmm. This now becomes my immediate family. Mm -hmm. She is my flesh. She is my blood. We are one. And that oneness that God intends in the marriage covenant goes beyond just, you know, the surficial uh, of a technical name. And, and yeah, go get the driver's license change. Get this, the, the, uh, the, the passport. Do all of that. that. That's wonderful. But let's go a little bit deeper. You know, where, where, where 
where a person's treasure is, their heart is also. Mm -hmm. um, I wish you would have a separate bank account on the side. <laughs> I'm messing with you. But see, becoming one, I mean, for us in, in, in our marriage, because we, we see the vision of God in becoming one, we have one account. Yes. And you know, all my money is her money. All her money is yes, her money. It's my money. Is, is my money. <laughs> it's my money. <laughs> all of my debt became her debt. All of her debt became my debt. We became one. One, one in name and aim, purpose focus and direction. Now, I hope you all are enjoying this yes. uh, in the name of Jesus. But let's let's talk about sex for a moment because the marriage covenant is a blood covenant. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. Married people aren't engaging in sexual intimacy like like they should. Mm -hmm. And then you've got unmarried people engaging in this act of marriage. You know, I've gotten to the place where I, I even don't see the act of marriage or sex. I, I see it as the act of becoming one. Mm -hmm. So now when we, when we have our times of intimacy, what's running through my mind, through the revelation that's come forth in this series, that in this moment we're becoming one. And then in the moments that we're not, you know, especially, you know, th that's the act of becoming two. When we're not engaged in the act of becoming one. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So the point that we're wanting to stress here is just point number one. So if you're taking notes, jot this down. The marriage covenant is a blood covenant. Amen. So covenant can be defined or is defined as being much stronger than an agreement or contract. Uh, Pastor pointed out that when you get married, there's a contractual agreement between yourself and your spouse. They call it the marriage license. Um, it is an irrevocable pledge or vow. Yeah. And so basically what that means is it can't change. Yeah. You know, if it's destroyed by fire, the right. contract in which we made together yeah. is still the contract, um, whether it's, you know, on paper or not. And so when you make a vow, oh, I wish mm -hmm. to God that people would understand before they yeah. decide to get married, the implication that goes with that. Um, and I believe, you know, with doing so, the rate of divorce yeah. will come down considerably if we took the time to just think about what that means. What does it mean to really make a covenant and not think of it as just a, a piece of paper that when it doesn't work out, we can rip it up and then that's the end of it. Um, and so I'll say it again, it's an irrevocable pledge or vow, a promise between parties carried out to the terms agreed upon that can only be broken by death. And so we see those kinds of covenants made in the Old Testament time yeah. and time again. They made blood covenants and the only way to cancel yeah. it out, so to speak, Somebody's gotta somebody die. had to die. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a covenant. Yeah. And what we want you to understand, we want your children to understand, mm -hmm. what we want every unmarried person, every married person to understand, that it's not just a license. It's not easy in and easy out. Correct. That you should see it as a covenant. And a covenant beyond agreement, beyond a contract. Is something that you vow and you keep. Look at this, and you can see this expressed throughout Scripture. But in Deuteronomy 22 and 20, mm -hmm. so if you would go there, <clears throat> and we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 and uh, verse 20 through 22. I thought it was cool because Luke chapter 22 and verse 20 is our, our golden text for this series. Mm -hmm. And this is Deuteronomy 22 and 20. It says this, but if the thing is true and evidences of virginity, are not found for the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So shall you put away the evil from among you. Verse 22 says, if a man be found lying with a woman, who's married to a husband, then both of them shall die. 
the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall you put away evil from Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, God is talking to the children of Israel. Um, and, and, but there's something here that we can learn from this. God was very, very serious about the marriage covenant. I believe he still is today. Mm -hmm. Now, I, you Absolutely. know, obviously the requirements, you know, you, you know, you, you can't just be killing folks. <laughs> <laughs> you might feel like killing somebody, but you can't be killing folks over this. But, but, but there's something definitely. He's talking to the children of Israel. And the Bible says that the Old Testament we have the old covenant writings mm -hmm. so for our admonition so we can learn from it yes and there's something here pertaining to covenant because what we're trying to minister to you is that the marriage is a covenant yes. and it is a blood covenant and by definition of covenant can only be broken by death i mean that's what we say in our vows until death do us part Mm -hmm. So now there's two aspects here because he's talking about the tokens of or the evidences of virginity. What is that talking about? Well, uh, in that day, because of the way God designed the marriage covenant to be, he only intended for a man and woman to be together with just themselves, a monogamous relationship as it would be. And so that little girl is supposed to keep herself until marriage. Mm -hmm. And then in the act of marriage, in that on that night of their marriage and they consummate the marriage that hymen is broken the blood is shed and that consummates this marriage covenant well the shedding of that blood would end up on that sheet and for the children of israel they were instructed bring the sheet out as evidence that this girl was indeed a virgin and if it wasn't found i mean that was like a life or death deal for that little girl mm -hmm. and then also i mean I'm, I'm glad he added that if a man has a wife and and she, what, let me read it correctly. He says, if a man is found laying with a woman who has a husband, so that's an adulterous relationship. He said, then both of them shall die. This blood covenant is a very serious thing in the eyes of God. Now, obviously, you know, the, I said this before, that in a woman's body, that hymen was a membrane. There's no natural function that the doctor can tell us about. But it's supernaturally designed. And our sons and daughters, you know, I'm thinking about you parents out there. I'm thinking about Russell and Tori, who just had a, a little boy not too long ago. Paul Sheffield and Ashley just had a little girl not too long ago. I'm thinking about St Stephen Lewis and Ann Swan. You know, so many of us that are young parents. You know, for me, I want to be able to teach my boys what circumcision is. Yes. I don't want them to have to find that out in health class. I, I don't want to have to leave it up to anyone else. I want to explain to them that this is what circumcision is and, and this is what it meant. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to be able to tell them that, you know, your PP is your covenant keeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, you don't put this anywhere. And then when the time comes, that's between you. You know, I don't know at what point I'm going to have to teach them that, obviously, when they get older. Uh, and, and for little girls, I mean, we don't yeah. have little girls, but, you know, uh, you know if, if you ever have as a mom at the appropriate age the opportunity to talk about, explain her anatomy to her and tell her God designed this as your covenant keeper. Mm -hmm. and, and think about it as men, you know, we relieve ourselves every day. We ought to be reminded daily. That's my covenant keeper. I don't give this to anyone but the woman that I'm in covenant with. And a woman, we should, as a woman, can, can be reminded daily. You know, as I said, you know, now when, when we're together intimately, I see it not as sex. I don't even see it as the act of becoming one, which it is. I see it as, well, not the act, just the act of marriage. I see it as the act of becoming one, that this, that we are covenant keepers in that respect. Amen. So if you're taking notes, just want to um, stress again that this is point number one. The marriage covenant is a blood covenant. Amen. So with that being said, let's look at Malachi 2 and 14. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. She is your companion and your wife by covenant. And so marriage was intended to be a real blood covenant. And it is a blood covenant. Yeah. 
So, uh, so, uh, yeah, and it is a real blood covenant. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, well, I, I wasn't a, a virgin when I got married. And that might be your story. So I don't have that experience of, you know, my husband being a virgin and I was a virgin and, you know, oh, that wonderful picture. That's probably the rarity. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what we're hoping is to turn and create a generation mm -hmm. of young people that desire to abstain. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that go to college today, you know, and purposefully, be, you know, keeping them. So we, we desire that. But, but let's say that's not your story. You know, yeah. does that mean we, you know, that this, none of this applies? No, it does apply. Yes. Because think about sexually transmitted diseases. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there are certain diseases that you can only get through having sexual intercourse. Yes. I mean, you know, when HIV first came out, you know, there was this, everybody was scared. But, you know, you could shake hands with a person with the, the AIDS virus and, and, and not contract it. Mm -hmm. But if you're sexually in you, why is that? And let me explain. Even though uh, there there's no necessary exchange of blood, like a, a blood transfusion or, you know, needle, a, a, you know, with drug use. But because, I don't know if it's the, the thin layer of the skin in sexual intimacy, something can get into your blood and you can give something into somebody else's blood. What am I saying? This sacred act mm -hmm. is a covenant act. Mm -hmm. It is a blood covenant. Just as it was in times of old where, you know, people would enter into blood covenants. They would cut them, cut themselves and mingle their blood. And, you know, if I'm O positive, you know, she happens to be O positive. But if she were O negative, you know, and we, you know, exchange blood, her blood's not going to change. You know, her blood is her DNA. My, I have mine. But what, what that mingling of the blood, it was a symbolic that we are in covenant relationship and in intimacy. There is that mingling of the blood that says we are in covenant relationship. Let me, let me finish this point by challenging those of you that are parents from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6 through 9. It says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Mm -hmm. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We are challenging every parent to teach these realities at the appointed season of your child's life. And understand this, children no more especially teenagers, no more than you might <laughs> might want to know. Yeah. Explain to your children the physical symbolism of their own bodies. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, be reminded daily of covenant keeping. You know, married couples, be reminded in moments of intimacy that this is the act of becoming one, that this is covenant keeping. And see these moments of intimacy as God has designed. Let's talk about abstaining from sexual in intimacy. This is our second point for today. Just a couple more. Amen. So the main, the, the main thing we want to get across to you is that marriage is a blood covenant. But number two, we're challenging everybody that's watching this to abstain from sexual intimacy. Yes. And I say everybody. I, I can remember I was an assistant pastor in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And a woman came up to me wanting prayer and, you know, she was having some issues. And so we get to come to find out she was struggling with fornication and she was 70. You know, I had to keep a straight face. <laughs> I had to keep a straight face. But in reality, all of us are impacted by the sexual drive that God has given us. Yes. And, and we need to know what to do with that. And what was that for? And, 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 and how does that relate? Well, the reason why we add this second point to abstain from sexual in in intimacy, not just because abstinence is, is our idea, mm -hmm. but it's actually the word of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, God says, for this is the will of God, mm -hmm. your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. 
So no matter your age, whether you're a teenager or whether you're a widow or, a, you know, as a, as a man or a woman in your 60s, 70s or 80s, this word is for you. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, this is the will of God. What is that? That you be monogamous. Amen. In other words, that you be with, with one person that you're married to intimately or don't be with anybody in that regard. Mm -hmm. He says, this is the will of God and this is for your sanctification. In other words, this is what separates you and makes you different from the world. Yes. Oh man, this is good. And then he says it very clearly that you should abstain from sexual immorality. And then in 1 Peter 2 and 11, it says, Behold, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Um, so just as Peter made a plea, I make a plea to you mm -hmm. to abstain from fleshly lust. Yeah. And so immorality, sexual immorality can simply be defined as engaging in immoral acts or wickedness, as the Bible would say. And so there are several things that, you know, fall within this category. Um, it's not right for a husband to sleep with someone he's not married to. Um, it's not right for a teenager to have sex with an adult, right. uh, with another teen or even with a child. Yeah. Um, molestation isn't right, right in any regard. Yeah. Uh, rape is not right. Yeah. Uh, watching other people mm -hmm. engage in some immoral activity is not right. Um, two guys or two women being together is not right. A threesome isn't right. And these are just the, a, a small list of things that fall within the category of being immoral. Mm -hmm. um, the list goes on. Um, but the Bible is very clear um, that we are to set ourselves apart. And he tells us that because it helps in our witness to others mm -hmm. when we abstain, when we make a decision to um, just decide this is just something I'm not going to do. And in doing so, we are better witnesses to others that may be struggling in this area. But, but what, if it, what if it just feels right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's looking at me so strange. What? You know, there, you, you might be watching right now. Some what? of you remember this song. You know, the guy said, if loving you is wrong, then I don't want to be right. You know, our bodies, um, you know, and, and you might feel like you're in love with this person, but if they're married to somebody else, it's just not right. And even if you're only just with them, that's not it's right. Not right. Right. And, you know, again, and so, you know, the evaluation, you know, how do you define sexual immorality? Because what we're challenging you through this Covenant Keeper campaign, not just the series. But we're just going to make this ongoing year after year as, you know, kids go from faith kids to tag youth ministry. We want them to be exposed that, you know, hey, at some point, if you desire to, to make a vow of abstinence, you know, before God, we want to support you in that. And, and, and you unmarried people, as you're preparing yourself. My wife shared this with me yesterday as we were getting ready. One of the things that Balaam advised Balak, he couldn't curse the people of God. Correct. Balak hired Balak. He said, hey, the children of Israel are too great, too mighty. You know, curse them. He said, now nah, I can only do what God says. And God said, bless. So he blessed him. He, he says, I cannot reverse it. You know, mm -hmm. God has blessed. But then Balaam advised Balak on the side. He said, now look, you know, I, I, I know I can't curse them. Correct. But I do know this. If you send those Moabite women down there, and those guys get to seeing them and they get to being with people that God commanded them, then that will prevent them from their promised land. And, and I, I'm saying this by the Holy Spirit. Some of you unmarried people, some of you married people, mm -hmm. you've been struggling to reach your life potential. Yes. You, you've been struggling to see your dreams fulfilled because of these moments where you've not abstained. Where, where, where you've not kept yourself. I'm challenging you. Take this to heart. Yes. You know, I'm going to make a, a vow. We're going to renew our vows according to this, this revelation as being covenant keepers. We're going to get little, little tokens that remind us of covenant keeping little, you know, little things, little bracelets. And, you know, sometimes people get little rings and just little reminders that I've made a vow yes. that I only do this 
with the one that I'm married to. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, I was taught all of this a as a kid. I was raised to abstain from sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one scripture that I'll never forget. If so, if, if you could turn there with me in the book of First Corinthians, chapter six and verse 18. In the King James, it says flee fornication. But in the new King James, which gives us an understanding, we, we don't use the word fornication every day. But we understand what immorality is, and that's the definition of that word. But listen to this. In verse 18, the Bible says to flee sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Now, that's not just for the single person. Mm -hmm. That's not just for the child. That's for the married person, see? You know, fornication, well, if you just limit it to uh, having sex and you're not married, but if you're married, then that doesn't apply to me. But wait a minute, sexual immorality applies to everybody, right? Because you could be married and still be doing something sexually that's not right. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so he says, flee from it. So I would, uh, I was raised this way and I got to a point, man, my, my, my the friends in school, they were having sex and I'd find out about it. And I went home one day and I told my, my mom, I want to have sex. Everybody's having sex. You know, she tried her best, you know, well, if everybody jumps off a bridge, you're going to jump off too. You know, you know, she did her best to hold me off what the Bible says, flee fornication. And I threw out, I was like, well, mom, did you and dad wait before? And she was like, you know, my dad walked in finally. And she said, Stanley, talk to your son. And I remember this to this day. He said, son, there's a special blessing if you wait. Amen. And that was enough to keep me as a child. I was 26 years old. When I got married and I was still a virgin. And that's my heart cry. That that not be such a rare experience that a boy or a girl, you know, wait until they get married. It ought to be. That's how we raise. You know, I'm challenging us as parents. We want our boys to be raised in the nurture and admonition, the teaching of the Lord. And this is the will of God. This is what God teaches that you're only supposed to be with the person that you're married to. We are giving you as parents and as adults and as, as people, whether in a marriage or out of, we're giving you the tools to win in life. Mm -hmm. I pray this message goes viral. Yeah. So notice this. Uh, so I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not giving you my personal testimony so you can think any, any more highly than, to me than you ought to. And I'm, not, I, I, I'm absolutely saying this for your benefit. You know, we're called, my wife and I, to help parents raise their children the right way. We're called to help unmarried people live their best life. Mm -hmm. to enter into their promised land. We're called to help marriages be protected against affairs and divorce. Yes. This is the will of God. I'm going to share one more with you before we shift and go in a different direction. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, God said in verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Mm -hmm. Now, this is God through Moses telling the children of Israel about their kings. And he's saying, you know, don't you, the king is not supposed to have a bunch of wives. Correct. And, and the reason why is so that his that his heart doesn't turn away. Mm -hmm. And he also shouldn't greatly multiply. Not, not that he can't have money, but he he shouldn't greatly multiply money. Now, how does that apply to us today? Well, in Romans chapter five, the Bible says that we're supposed to reign as kings in this life. Mm -hmm. So I believe this word for not multiplying wives, obviously, you know, you only should be married to one person, of course, legally here. And, but, but I'm also talking about not multiplying to yourself um, many different intimate partners. There's a reason why you should, you know, Keep yourself just for one person. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you in the word of God. As a young person, as, as a, a grown up, a young adult, having this strong sexual desire, wanting to be intimate, but wanting to do it God's way. When I read this scripture, revelation flooded my heart. Finally, I could understand David. I mean, when you think about David and, and Bathsheba, I mean, David was married and Bathsheba was married at the time that they had, a, had, an, had an affair. 
And, and when you think about, you know, like, I mean, he's the king. He's got not only one wife at the moment. He had uh, Mikau. He had another lady uh, and Hinnom Noam. I ain't getting the names right. He had Abigail and this other girl, or other lady named Eglag. All he had four wives. He's the king of the land, and he's out there on a porch one night. I mean, come on, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a reason why God says what He says. Why? Listen, if you've never had something, you don't really have a desire for it. Correct. For example, my wife, she's never watched pornography. You know, well, one of the things I've struggled with, and, and I don't say this pridefully, um, it, I, I, you know, I would, I wouldn't have in sexual intercourse, but there'd be times I'd really struggle and I'd end up watching pornography, and I knew that to be sexually immoral. That's mm -hmm. not right, mm -hmm. right? Well, and, and even as an adult, as a married husband, the thought will come, a temptation to come. Well, you know, oh, why don't you go? Look? Oh, no, no, I'm a covenant keeper. Right. So now I, I, I keep myself, even though there may be a, a, a tug there to look at something I shouldn't look at or, you know, to see something I'm not supposed to see. No, I position myself as a covenant keeper. But for her, it's not even a struggle. And I can tell you, for me, I have no desire to be with a, an Asian woman or a Hispanic woman or a Caucasian woman or, a, you know, a different. I, I have that, not, not that desire. And I can tell you one of the reasons is because I don't know what that's like. Am I preaching good to anybody today? So there's a reason why God tells us and what goes on in our hearts. Now, all of a sudden, I'm creating in my body an appetite for more. Because I remember with so-and-so, with it was like that. And with so-and-so, it was like that. I mean, I've only been with, you can count the number of people I've been, women I've been with on half of one hand in my lifetime. Well, I don't have that appetite. And there's a reason why God says what he says. And we're challenging you to hear this. And especially if you have children at the appointed time, raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Yes. So with that being said, let's take a look at Romans 8 and 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Um, and so with thinking about this, if you've made a mistake, you've gone in the wrong direction, this verse here says that when you commit yourself to God, when you make that decision not to walk after fleshly desires, there's no condemnation. Yeah. Satan would have it that he would have you condemned, keep you bound, keep that ever before your eyes that you've made this mistake. You're not worthy to be called a Christ follower, you know, at all. But the, the, the word of God is just so intentional in saying that when you walk after my ways, when you've commit yourself yeah. unto me, you're no longer condemned. You're free from all of that. And so we are in no way trying to condemn anybody. Um, unlike pastor, my story is just a little different. I can recall when we were dating and he shared his testimony. I reached out to my sister, like, I think God made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I cannot marry this dude. And she's like, what happened? I say, I, I don't share in the testimony that I, I'm a virgin unto marriage. I don't have that testimony that I get to share, you know? And so with reading Romans and my relationship with God, he just reaffirmed that, no, sweetheart, I didn't make a mistake. This is who I chose for you. So you you don't have to walk condemned or yeah. believed to be bound yeah. or uh, ashamed because you made a mistake mm -hmm. or even feel inferior because of the life that he chose to live. That's his testimony, but yours is different. And it's not bad. We all have a history. That's why it's called a history but with God there's a new beginning mm -hmm. and with making a decision at this point to yeah. be a covenant keeper yeah. you can start over yeah. so I'm gonna say it again the Bible says there is now yeah. therefore no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh amen, amen. you know some for some, that decision wasn't even an option. 
You know, they were molested as a child. Um, and then there are others that, you know, it, it hasn't just wasn't even a mistake. For some, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But for all who are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's, he's a new, a new creature. creation. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. Yes. So there are a lot of things that I've done that I should go to hell for. Mm -hmm. But thank God for the grace of God and the yes. mercy of God. Hallelujah. We're saying this not to condemn you, but to help you. Mm -hmm. There's one more in Jeremiah chapter three and verse, verse number one. He says here, they say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man, another man's, may he return to her again. Would not that land be poll greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. You know, this is a very powerful and revealing passage of scripture. It reveals the heart of God. And, and the Lord gave me this to, to share it with you. Now, let's let, let's make sure we understand what's happening here. Now, he said, now, you, now they say, if a man divorces a wife, so a guy and a girl, they're married. They get divorced. So they're divorced. And she goes from him and become another man's. Now, whether it be she becomes another man's wife or that's just his girl. They say, may he return to her again? Would not the land be greatly polluted? In other words, people's attitudes were, if there was a husband and wife, they get divorced, and then she's gone off to be with somebody else, should he come back to that woman again? And they said, no, no, man, no, she done been with somebody else. No, you know, she's, you know, in, in other words, that, that would be pollution. That would be bad. Here's the point. He says, but you have played the harlot mm -hmm. with many lovers, and yet I say, return to me, says the Lord. Now, I've got, I, I got to minister this to you because this is so revealing about the love of God. Yeah. He sees himself married to Israel. He sees that Israel has gone and played. I, I want to say played the whole, but I, I don't think I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> played. Oh, I just said it. Okay. Well, maybe we can. <laughs> played the harlot with many lovers. And he says, I want you back. Mm -hmm. Let me minister to you just in case you're a married person and maybe you've messed up. That doesn't mean it's the end of the covenant. What covenant says is I want you regardless of what you've done or don't do. Mm -hmm. God says, come back to me. He sees himself. He says it in this passage. I'm married to the backslider. Mm -hmm. So child of God, no matter where this message finds you, mm -hmm. whether you've been involved in homosexual relationships before, mm -hmm. whether you've been in, in, in involved in, in being a pimp or in prostitution, whether you've been involved in adultery or fornication, whether you've made little mistakes, whether you're into pornography, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. God wants you back. Yeah. And what we're saying to you in this, this message is come back to him. Mm -hmm. Come to him. Make some heart decisions. Mm -hmm. Position yourself to abstain from sexual immorality. Amen. Make the marriage decision. Make the marriage covenant. Amen. And you will be blessed. So even today, we would say the same thing. But God is saying something different. Maybe you've already messed up a thousand times, but I believe that God is saying, return to me. You can begin again. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're a teenager watching this right now. and You've already done some things. That's OK. Repent and make a vow. Maybe you're in, uh, maybe you were molested or, or maybe you were raped. That's OK. God will deal with them. Make a vow. Maybe you're an unmarried person and, you know, you, 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 you like doing what you're doing. Okay, repent, which means turn and go in a different direction and make a vow. Maybe you're a married person and, and maybe you've messed up. Repent. Make a vow. We want to conclude on, on point number three, which is we want to challenge everybody. As, as we're going to make some announcements about this Covenant Keeper campaign, 
We're going to get some tokens of this covenant vow. We want to challenge you, if you're watching or listening to this right now, we want to challenge you to make a vow to be a covenant keeper. Whether you're married or whether you're not, you can keep covenant with God in this matter. Yes. There's a few scriptures in the Bible, and I won't take long to teach this. Is, you know, we're essentially out of our time. But the Bible does say about vows and making vows. In Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2 and 3, it says, If a man makes a vow to the Lord and swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that, he, that, that proceeds out of his mouth. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house, in her youth. One of the things that we're going to be doing through our youth ministry for those that are, have parents that agree, we're going to give the, 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 the older teenagers the opportunity to make a vow, to bind themselves, to, 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 to be able to make uh, an, an agreement before God to keep themselves. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter five and verse four, it says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it for he who for he God has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. You know, we're going to challenge you. Don't just have it in your heart and I'm going to do better. Mm -hmm. But when you, you know, take a moment and make it sacred, I'm going to make a vow. I mean, I made vows to you and I have every intention to keep them. And I'm going to have tokens of that. Remember, that's what my marriage ring is. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me that I said something to somebody that I need to keep. Oh, mm -hmm. glory to God. In Acts chapter 18, so just so you'll know that it's not just in the Old Testament that they made vows. In the New Testament, the Bible says that Paul still remained a, a good while. Then he took a leave uh, of the brethren and sailed to Syria with uh, Priscilla and Aquila. They were with him. Why? For he had his hair cut off as a symbol at Sincrea, uh, mm -hmm. for he had taken a vow. I said all of that to say that Paul cut his hair off because he had made a vow. You know, in other words, as a sign, I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to bind myself to these words. And we're challenging you to make a vow to be a covenant keeper. And then here's a couple of other scriptures that have just helped me. Job 31 and 30, Job said this. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Yeah, it is. Marquita, he was a married man. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? I'm making a covenant with my eyes. I'm not looking at young women. As a, as a husband, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look at pornography. That's a sin of the past, mm -hmm. not of the present, and it won't be of the future. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I'm a covenant keeper, right? Mm -hmm. And we're challenging you to be the same. And there's, there's ammunition. In, in, in Psalm 101, stanza three, David said this. He said, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Think about that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to look at things that I shouldn't be looking at. He said, I hate the work of those who fall away. Pornographers in this world, they're falling away. Mm -hmm. Adulterers in this world, they're falling away. I know some of you, this just come up in my heart. Some of you ladies, you know, certain books, you may not look at, you know, the DVDs and the internet, but some of the things that are written by certain authors are just as pornographic as, as, as watching it on TV. And mm -hmm. pornography is not just a man thing. It's, it's, it's an everybody thing. Mm -hmm. But here's your ammunition. He says, I will. He's making a covenant. He's making a vow. He's saying, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. And then lastly, he said, it shall not cling to me. Mm -hmm. These, All of these things, sexual immorality is addictive in nature. Mm -hmm. But by the word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. And I just want to speak to the person um, and it actually just came up in my heart uh, that if you were uh, molested or raped at any point um, I too shared that story as a, a young kid that was I want you to know that you are still able to make a covenant with God you can move forward at this point onward um, I don't want you to feel ashamed. That's not what God would have for you. That is a mistake 
that you didn't cause. And for years, there was a shame that would come over me. You know, I would think that only ugly people would deal with something of the sort. And so maybe that's your story. You can't relate, you know, with uh, going out and intentionally engaging in, in moral acts or with sexual acts with others. You're battling that, that thing that keeps playing in your mind, um, that keeps you ashamed of who you are. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to be. Let this be your new beginning. Yes. Make a vow before God to be a covenant keeper. He will heal you, and that will be my prayer for you, that the Lord will begin to heal the hurt that has been caused even in your past, and he can do it right today. I am standing you know, before you freed of what happened in my past, but it took some time. It took me making a commitment unto God and just allowing his word to just wash me through and through, knowing that when I made the decision to be a Christ follower, that I'm no longer condemned. And regardless of what Satan says, Jesus died on the cross for me as well. And he took that sin, that shame, that evil, wicked act that was caused unto me, and he nailed it to the cross. And so today, I encourage you to just be free. You know, make that decision to run hard after God and allow him to heal those places that you keep hidden from others. We want to pray with you right now. I pray that you find yourself in this message. Mm -hmm. Let's just pray before God. Bow your heads with me. If you're listening or watching this right now and you've made some mistakes yeah. or mistakes were made against you, mm -hmm. let's allow God into our hearts to heal us right now. Yes. For some of us, we need to be saved. For others of us, we need to rededicate our lives to God. Yes, God. Let, let, let us lead you in that prayer right now. I want you all to repeat this after me. Say this out loud. Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Thank you for this word today. I receive it. And I purpose in my heart in the next weeks and months to come to be a covenant keeper. Teach me more. Reveal your will that I may obey it. I do believe that Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he died for me bearing my sins for me, the mistakes that I did, the sins that I committed, nailing them to the cross. I also believe that you raised him from the dead, that Jesus is alive. Come into my heart. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And I accept your offer of forgiveness. I'm now a new creation. Condemnation, Condemnation, you have no more place. You have no more place. Shame and inferiority, Shame and inferiority. You've, got to go. you've got to go. I'm born again, I'm born again. A, child a child of God, clean before the Lord, clean before the Lord. With, a future. with a bright future. In Jesus' name, In Jesus amen. Name. Amen. amen, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the faith family. Yes. We believe that your life will forever be marked. 